Shalom and welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing Israel's incredible success known as Startup Nation and looking at the spiritual underpinnings of this incredible economic miracle taking place in Israel. Welcome to the program. And today's guest is all the way from Israel, and it is uh, Stefan Silva from uh, the director of Wise Money Israel. Uh, I have to say, welcome back to the Middle East Report. I know that uh, you're on the last program in which we discussed your incredible uh, military career serving in IDF, but here we're talking about um, your passion, which is uh, finance, economics, as well as being a messianic pastor in Israel. Uh, can you remind our, our viewers a little bit about how the Lord has uh, used you uh, in Israel, that you're, you're, you're involved in business, but you're also a pastor at a messianic fellowship in Haifa? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I, I shared my testimony in the last program about just how God really brought me through the Second Lebanon War and brought me into a personal uh, relationship with Him as a growing adult. And uh, I think ever since a young age, I knew that I was called to my people, um, to the Jewish people, uh, to share with them the good news about the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. And um, after I finished my military service, I got involved uh, also with some ministry work with my uh, dad, uh, speaking about Israel to the nation, something that uh, I'm, I think, also passionate about is, is just sharing the truth about Israel, um, sharing with believers around the world what their connection with Israel should be. Uh, and, and then it was maybe more in a, uh, what you could call more of a theological, spiritual understanding uh, level. Uh, after that, I also got into some media evangelism and was doing a lot of that in Israel, uh, really pioneering that movement, which now is very developed uh, in Israel. Lots of uh, uh, videos, uh, testimonies, evangelism that's being done through the media, uh, through you know high quality videos, uh, radio stations, things like that, in order to reach the Jewish people with the good news of Messiah without uh, you know, only standing out on the streets and giving out leaflets and things like that, which is maybe something more common of uh, the previous century. Um, and, and so I guess just as uh, uh, time has gone on, uh, uh, another passion that I've always had has been business and economics. I did a, an undergraduate degree at, the, uh, in, at a university in, in Israel uh, in um, economics and management, uh, and then I did an MBA at uh, Haifa University. And uh, after that, I, I really felt uh, called uh, to step into a more of a, a serious uh, leadership position in our congregation. I go to a, uh, now help lead a congregation called Kerem El, which means God's Vineyard. Uh, it's a very young, vibrant, growing, Hebrew-speaking only congregation located right on, in the center of uh, Mount Carmel, Haifa, Central Carmel yeah. is what it's called. And, um, and alongside with that, uh, I also finished my MBA, and that's also when I stepped into a position at Wise Money Israel, which is the first and only uh, Messianic Jewish believer run or Messianic run uh, portfolio management and uh, portfolio management firm uh, in Israel. And so basically, we work with believers to invest in Israel on a financial uh, level. Uh, but the underlying uh, reasons for that are usually uh, not only the, the financial reasons, which are good and, and should be considered as well, but then also the spiritual reasons uh, beneath that, which also has to do with connecting the nations with Israel and blessing Israel and its economy. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at this uh, excellent video. Uh, it's been produced uh, by uh, Stefan that talks about um, wise money, Israel. Israel is a nation which is rich in antiquity, bustling with life, and full of opportunity. Throughout their history, they have pushed the limits, beaten the odds, and have become known today as the Miracle Nation. Boasting an economy that is one of the most resilient and vibrant in the world, 
Israel's open and free market is a shining light of success and sustainability. Even during seasons of global financial instability and recession, Israel's economy remains surprisingly strong with positive growth. This booming and secure economic environment is made possible by cultivating a workforce of brilliant people dedicated to creating solutions and determined to succeed. Israelis are known for not taking no for an answer. This is part of the entrepreneurial spirit that drives innovation from high-tech energy and construction to communication, defense, and agriculture, and in turn leads to breakthrough and disruptive technologies that have left a monumental and lasting impression on every continent in the world. Israel's financial market has become one of the most fertile and attractive international investment destinations. And so while we build and we propel Israel forward, we can benefit from its success. Wise Money Israel is an Israeli investment firm dedicated to serving our clients and caring for their financial well-being. Whether individuals, corporations, or non-profit organizations from around the globe, we prudently manage our clients' portfolios and guide them into the Israeli capital market. Having successfully invested hundreds of millions of shekels, Wise Money Israel has earned its reputation as a trustworthy and secure home for investment capital. Partnering with the largest and most well-known brokerages in Israel, our firm offers stock and bond investing directly on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. We assist our clients to diversify their capital by investing in leading Israeli companies in the shekel, giving them an alternative to their local holdings. With a high level of integrity, professionalism, and personal client attention, Wise Money Israel clients have enjoyed solid returns on their investments year over year. Not only do we aspire for your investments to succeed, but we want you to succeed as you help Israel lead and shape the world toward a bright and promising future. So invest securely. Think Israel. So now you know, if you've got money, where to invest it. <laughs> uh, great video there. Um, Thank you. Stefan, really impressive. Now, Israel's been described as the uh, startup nation. So can you tell our, our viewers what that title actually means? Well, today they speak about Israel as a startup nation because of the vast amount of startups, which is among the highest in the world. It's actually the highest, Israel has the highest amount of startups in the world per capita. And in absolute uh, terms, it's between number two to number three. Now, when we talk about Israel being a very modern uh, state with all of this technology and all these innovations that are coming out of Israel, some of which, you know, day-to-day -day, um, products and services that we use that we don't even have any idea that were actually invented uh, in Israel and have come out from Israel and have changed life as we know it, um, these, these startups are just happening all the time uh, as, as time goes on. And so um, that's why Israel is referred to as the startup nation, the, the investment uh, as a percentage of GDP into uh, research and development. Uh, you saw in the video some of the companies, the major global uh, um, companies that are investing uh, in Israel and that are opening research and development centers. Uh, Microsoft and uh, Facebook and Apple and Yahoo and Google, all of the main, uh, all of these large tech companies have uh, some of the most strategic and sensitive research and development centers in Israel because that's where the, 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 these ideas and this innovation uh, is all coming from. Yeah. So Stefan, the idea of a startup <coughs> is essentially um, a company. Um, and a number of different companies that are being birthed. Um, particularly when we talk about Israel, we talk about technology and innovation. Is that what you mean by startup nation? Uh, it is. I, I actually take it a step further and, and first of all, create um, more of a, a spiritual understanding about, uh, which I think is important for us as believers, as to why Israel is influencing the world in such a way and why so many technologies are coming out of Israel and from Jewish people and influencing the entire world. And, and what I say is that Israel is not just a startup nation, 
but that in fact Israel is God's startup nation. And when you look at startups and a typical life of a startup and some of the milestones that a startup goes through throughout its, its lifetime, and then you go back to the scriptures and you look uh, in the Bible about how God's startup nation Israel actually was formed and began and, and some of the milestones that it has gone through over time, then I have found a, a, a very close uh, parallel. And so I say that the startup concept isn't something that we've encountered in the past 50, 60, 70 years, end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, but, uh, but rather um, uh, a concept that God himself has come up with. And we see in the Bible 4,000 years ago when he began uh, his startup nation with one man uh, called Abraham. Uh, and that's really where it all began. You know, when you look at startups and how they begin, it's usually one or two people, maybe a handful of people that have a crazy idea to go out and do something that has never been done before. And, and, and to go into what you would call uncharted territory. And so a lot of it is about faith and trust. And when you look at God's startup nation, well, it began with one man who God gave a very uh, clear calling to, into, to, to go, lech lecha, get out of your, your father's land, uh, out of Padan Aram, read about it in Genesis uh, chapter 12. And he says, go to a land that I will show you. And, uh, you know, Abraham didn't have Google Street View uh, back in those <laughs> days. So he didn't know where he was going. He couldn't look it up online. Uh, but it was a call uh, to, to go, to go into uncharted territory. And when you look at Abraham, he had no prospect of growth. Uh, he was married to Sarai, who was barren. Uh, he was old and he had no children. And he even, uh, we read about it in Damascus, he asked God, is Eliezer of Damascus going to inherit me because I do not have any um, children of my own? So, so this startup nation began with one man uh, with a very clear call to go into uncharted territory uh, and he had no prospect of growth. But then as we look at the lives of startups, they go then usually into phases of rapid growth, which we see with Israel uh, later, with, uh, later in uh, Exodus that they've already grown to two to three million when they're leaving uh, Egypt. Um, and then I, I think it's important to also note uh, that startups, if anybody had a startup or, or had an idea, they would want their idea, their technology, their product, their service, whatever it may be, not just to be an incremental uh, breakthrough, but rather to be disruptive. And, and disruptive technologies, I think as we know, uh, technologies that, that forever, that, they're basically game changers. They change how things are done from that point uh, forward. And Israel has supplied a number of uh, physical, tangible uh, services and products that have been disruptive and have changed life uh, as we know it. Some examples could be the USB uh, key, which is an Israeli uh, invention, and of course, cherry tomatoes, which we all uh, have at some point throughout the day, uh, just to name a couple. But, uh, but also that God has used Israel as his startup nation to bring about spiritual disruptive innovations to the world is, is how I call it. And we see that through the giving of the law or the Torah at Mount Sinai. We see that once again um, uh, with, the set, with the first coming of Messiah, uh, Yeshua, when he's the, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, God in the form of man who died for our sins. And I believe that the next station or the next uh, uh, super disruptive uh, spiritual innovation that we are yet to see uh, will be seen through uh, the second coming of Messiah, which is also, uh, I believe at least, going to happen uh, still through his startup nation, uh, Israel. And so when we understand that God, that Israel is God's startup nation through which he brings about spiritual innovations to the world, uh, then we can also begin to understand how he's using Israel as a startup nation to bring about these wonderful technologies uh, and services and products that we uh, all enjoy today as well. Absolutely. And um, I've seen your presentation, uh, Stefan, which is uh, incredibly good. And in your presentation, uh, you look at the population growth uh, in Israel from when Israel was reestablished as a nation almost uh, 70 years ago, back in uh, the 14th of May, 1948, and compare it with today's population, which is nearly 9 million. What is it about Israelis? What is it about uh, the uh, Jewish mentality that is able to thrive because let's let's face it, Israel doesn't have any many good natural resources. No. It's pretty much uh, everything up here. Yeah. So, where does this stem from? Yeah, well, absolutely. The the greatest resource that uh, Israel and the Jewish nation has ever had, I think, um, is is in fact the human resource. And just up until 
2011, 2012, when the natural gas reservoirs were found just off the coast of Haifa, the city where I live, um, Israel had no natural resources whatsoever. Specifically, that discovery is gonna, has begun to change and is going to continue to change Israel's economy in the decades to come because of the magnitude of the, of the discovery. But um, I think, yeah, you know, the Jewish people, the focus has always been very much on life how to create, how to advance, uh, how to make things better. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that many of the nations that surround Israel, the focus is the exact opposite. It's not how we can focus on creating and on building and on living and on making a better life for our children, but rather the focus is on how do we destroy uh, and how do we kill. And uh, I believe it was Golda Meir who said that uh, there, will be no, there will be peace in the Middle East when the Arabs love their children more than what they hate uh, the Jews. Um, and, and I think that that is very true, and I think that um, that is one of the fundamental uh, uh, attributes of Israel, is that the focus is on life and how to advance, how to make life better, not only for ourselves, uh, but actually for the entire world. And uh, it's also interesting to, to see not only the growth inside Israel, uh, or, or of Israel as a nation in the past uh, almost 70 years, but also to look at the uh, proportion of Jewish people out of world population, which is 0.2% out of the world's population are Jewish. But when you look at the Nobel Prize winners since the, the, the institution of the Nobel Prize was, uh, was initiated and founded, um, Jewish people, again, make up 0.2% of the world's population, but they make up 20% one out of five of every Nobel Prize winner uh, is in fact of Jewish uh, origin. And, and so that, that uh, difference between 0.2% to 20% is 100 times. And so essentially the Jewish people uh, have had, and I believe still are having, an effect on the entire world 100 times greater than what we actually are uh, in, the, in the world uh, population. Um, and, and so I believe it, it has to do with that. I also believe that it has to do with uh, God's hand being upon uh, the Jewish people. And again, going back to Genesis 12 and the formation of God's startup nation, where he says uh, that you will be a blessing and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And I think that ultimately we have that blessing through uh, a relationship that we can all have with uh, the God of Israel through the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua. But I believe it also comes to bear in uh, practical things uh, in a day-to-day -day, uh, life where the Jewish people have given the world uh, so much in all of the different areas of technology, medicine, chemistry, uh, literature, the arts, uh, it's just, it's everywhere. And uh, Stephen, it's, it's incredible to think that uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so, um, Israel has been at the forefront of innovation, technology. Uh, I mean, according, according to my notes here, for example, Israel is, um, has more uh, companies listed on the NASDAQ, uh, excluding um, Ch USA and China, has more venture capital per capita and more startup companies than any other in the world. Um, mm. In your opinion, what do you think lies behind this uh, incredible economic success that is Israel today? I think that there have been, Israel has had to um, faces still and, and has had in the past, basically since the formation of the, of the state, and even beforehand going back into the, into the you know, uh, going back a few hundred years, uh, the need to innovate. And they say that um, necessity is the, is the mother of invention. And you know, even when you go back and, and sometimes people ask, well, why do Jewish people have all these uh, names like diamond and gold and silver, like my surname, uh, and Ruby Steen and, and all these names, a lot of it has to do because those were the, the trades that they had back in the Middle Ages because they could not hold any public offices and they were excluded from various positions uh, throughout uh, Christendom and throughout um, Europe uh, because of the anti-Semitism that was, was happening there. And Israel as a nation, ever since it was formed, has been in that same position, surrounded by enemies, constant state of war, and so it's needed to innovate. And so I think Israelis and Jewish people have that, uh, that uh, innovative uh, spirit, that out-of-the-box thinking. Uh, I think, like I mentioned in the video as well, they don't like, we don't like taking no for an answer. Um, you know, in, in, in Israel, even in the military, 
the uh, power distance is, is not very uh, high. So, you know, if I say something to the person that is in charge of me, to my boss, and he doesn't accept what I say, so I'm not just going to sit back and say, okay, uh, most Israelis will just go to the next person. And, and the next time that happens, they won't even go to their superior, they'll go to the superior's superior. <laughs> um, and while that has its drawbacks, yeah. uh, it's also what, what how I, I think Israel is constantly pushing the envelope. Uh, and constantly innovating and constantly moving uh, 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 things forward. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the challenges that Israel has faced and is facing in, in terms of um, natural resources. Lack of water has created desalination technology. Um, missile threats have created the Iron Dome. Um, all this, uh, all these other military uh, uh, challenges have, have created a, a very um, uh, innovative and modern um, uh, defense. Uh, industry and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, Israel has, has um, received, I believe it was over one million immigrants from the former Soviet Union uh, over the period of 10 years, a decade from the late 80s to the late 90s, that also forced Israel to have to uh, go about change internally. And so all of those factors together, uh, I believe, uh, contribute to that, uh, that startup. Uh, um, capacity and, and just the innovation that we see going on all the time. Let's have a look now and look at some of this, the reasons behind Israel's success in its uh, technolog technological advancement in the high-tech sector. We've only been here for less than two months, but already we've formed synergies with companies that we would never have expected. Just because we started chatting with them and asking them about their business, they asked us about ours. You can just open someone's door and start talking to them about what they do. And that is kind of the way ideas get exchanged. And in the end of the day, more ideas make for better products. For every startup that succeeds in Israel is everyone's success here. You don't see a lot of competition between Israeli startups. Their competition is actually overseas. The secret to the Israeli high tech is basically chutzpah. The Israeli offices of our company are located in a co-working space. And what's unique is that we have all the stakeholders of the ecosystem operating in one place. They're also really networking and helping each other on a daily basis. Israeli startups are targeting global markets overseas from day one. Most experienced entrepreneurs help the younger ones just because they want to help them. They want to see them thrive. They want to make sure that the success of Startup Nation has actually a future through those young entrepreneurs. Tel Aviv being such a well-renowned startup ecosystem, we help bring Australian entrepreneurs here and help them work on their product and on their startup. A lot of startups have said that the trip to Israel really changed the way they see business and they see how to build the startups. Coming to Israel, we've raised some capital, which was really fantastic, and that enabled us to really build our team here. This is a place where people are interested in how you're doing, who can they connect you to, and that's one of the really special things about being in an environment like this. And that gives us uh, some insight into uh, Israel's incredible success in terms of uh, technology and uh, innovation. Uh, it's incredible to think, uh, you know, here, looking at my notes here, um, that Israel has more scientists and tech professionals uh, than any other nation in the world. And in 2016, Israeli startups raised 4.8 billion in uh, venture funding, uh, a record that year. Um, this is quite incredible. So why is it that very few people, unless you're working in the finance sector or the innovation technological sector, would actually know that Israel is so successful in this area. We, we don't hear this in our, our mainstream media. Uh, other politicians don't say, let's look at Israel and how we can learn from Israel. You know, why is this not widely known? Israel's economy is a relatively small uh, economy. It's what you would call a niche economy. Um, it's a small nation, you know, few million people. Uh, and so compared to the UK, compared to the large economies of Europe, uh, Asia and, and America, uh, nobody is really looking here uh, in that 
sense, which is a shame because, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about startups which are usually privately owned companies. And so the ability for investors around the world to, to gain exposure to those uh, companies is, is very limited. Um, it's very limited and you need to have a, a lot of um, uh, funds in order to be able to invest in them. And the risk is relatively high. Only one out of every 10 uh, startups eventually succeeds and reaches levels where the return on investment uh, uh, makes sense to actually uh, invest in a kind of like these Cinderella stories, uh, so to speak. Um, but the, the, the publicly traded market is something that is, is much more accessible to uh, investors from around the world. Uh, that also has gone mainly unnoticed by the large uh, um, uh, exchanges around the world. And so I've met a lot of people that, you know, after I've spoken to them and they've, they've heard some of the things that I share about and talk about, then they're asking, well, how come I don't know this? How come my investment banker doesn't know that they can invest in Israel? And, and, and it's unfortunate that, that through the, the main stock exchanges, you can't actually gain access to the uh, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, where there are very large companies which are publicly traded. There are smaller companies which are still uh, publicly traded, but they're, they're developing and they, they have these technologies that are, uh, that are also growing. Uh, some of the larger companies actually own uh, the smaller privately owned startups, so they have uh, high stakes in those privately owned uh, startups. And actually, the, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is very interested uh, to see more investors investing in uh, the exchange and seeing more investors from outside coming in. And so they've actually uh, come up with this uh, concept of something that's called a, a closed and uh, hybrid mutual fund, where uh, there's going to be four of them rolling out uh, probably in, uh, at the beginning now of 2018, which will allow people to invest through the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange uh, and at the same, into these uh, mutual funds, which will consist of 50% uh, of the assets will be publicly traded companies, but the other 50% will be private, uh, privately owned startup companies with all these technologies like we've been seen in, seeing in some of these videos. And um, the, the, the taste, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is interested to do that because on the one hand, they want investors to have exposure to the startups because it's good for the portfolio. Uh, but on the other hand, they also want the startups to receive more funding and they also want the startups to remain uh, in Israel. Many times these uh, privately owned startups get bought out by these large corporations. You hear about it all the time. Uh, you know, big companies like Apple and Facebook and Microsoft, they, they have all these, find all these technology uh, companies, they pick them up for, you know, 10, 20, 40 million dollars, all the way into the hundreds of millions and billions of, of dollars even, and then they incorporate them into their own uh, companies and many times the jobs, uh, the, the funds, uh, and the people move from Israel overseas. Uh, which uh, is, in, is good for the economy on in one hand, but, but on the other hand, in the, the longer term, it, it, it doesn't keep the technology and the positions uh, in, in Israel. And so um, the TASE is trying to bring about uh, more uh, local startups to eventually IPO on the exchange, again, so that investors can have exposure to these companies and to the technologies that they are uh, producing for the world and the growth that they are seeing as well. Let's have a look now at uh, an excellent report about uh, Israeli technology uh, by Gordon Robinson. On April 15th, 2013, two bombs exploded during the Boston Marathon, killing three people and injuring 264 others. For the next three days, investigators reportedly used a high-tech system called BriefCam to analyze local surveillance video. Hours of video are condensed into minutes, and experts can zoom in on suspicious actions, like a backpack being left behind. BriefCam's video synopsis was instrumental in identifying the two bombers, and the technology was made in Israel. Technology is going to change all of our lives. It already has. And what's coming down the pike is going to be even more intense. Israel has often been called the startup nation. And while Jerusalem may be the spiritual heart of the country, Tel Aviv is the center of its startup success. Just a century ago, this thriving city was little more than a series of sand dunes. Today, it's been voted the second best high-tech center in the world. 
just after Silicon Valley. Israel was recently ranked the fourth most innovative nation in the world, from the iPhone to the PlayStation. Many of the ideas behind your favorite gadgets came from inventors right here in Israel. Flip top cell phones, keyboards for smartphones, Intel Pentium chips, the ability to print straight from your computer, the flash drive, the chip in the iPad, the OS that runs the Amazon Kindle, the chip that controls the Sony PlayStation, and the 3D sensor in the Xbox Kinect. Every year, American companies are shelling out more and more shekels to buy small Israeli startups. The latest example is Waze, an Israeli smartphone app that gives live traffic reports based on your location. It warns users about traffic jams, accidents, and even sitting police cars. In 2011, Waze made headlines by helping drivers navigate the LA traffic jam known as Carmageddon. Two years later, Google bought the program for just under a billion dollars, making it the most expensive app in history. I think the key challenge for Israeli companies now is to go from startup nation to scale up nation. We need to build bigger companies, not just sell them early to American multinationals, but to actually get them bigger, to get them into the sales process, and to create more jobs both here and in America and around the world. So what gives Israel its technological edge? We asked some of the country's most prominent business leaders, and the answer is, there's no single answer. Chutzpah is perhaps the most definitive Jewish word. Very, very hard to translate. Gall, unrelenting daring, this ability to try to do something which nobody else has done before, to say something which is a little bit out of place, to be in someone's face. That chutzpah is what allows us to actually break the boundaries and to break the rules and to go out of our comfort zone in order to create new things. There's a joke about what is the Jewish answer? It's a question, right? In other words, the Jews will answer a question with a question. That culture of challenging and debating and arguing, it's everywhere in Israel. Arguing is healthy because you get to better answers, you get to better results. And I think that is a key uh, cultural attribute in Israel's economic success story and its economic miracle. Our roots, our education, maybe even that it's coming from the Talmud is always being skeptical in asking questions. And I believe uh, this tradition, this culture, it's a part of our DNA. Whether you call it the Socratic method or the Talmudic method, you choose it. That's a big part of how we learn and how we teach our kids. If you were looking for a single group to basically make your ideal pool of entrepreneurs, you couldn't look for a better group than immigrants. Immigrants make great entrepreneurs because they already did it in their own lives. They were the CEO of mylife.com. They took risk, they moved to a foreign country, they had to handle legal and facilities and HR to get jobs and banking and marketing, and they basically had to scale up. Innovation has a direct correlation to diversity. If you all think alike, you all act alike, I'm sorry, it's not going to be a particularly creative place. In Jewish life, parents always advocated to the kid that he has to learn and also that he has to venture if you want to succeed. I always say that the secret source of the Israeli high tech is the Jewish mother who asked her son at the age of seven, after all what we have done for you, asking you for one Nobel Prize, is it really too much? Yossi Vardi is known as the godfather of Israel's high-tech industry. He's invested in more than 80 internet startups, including a company started by his son. I came with three of his friends. I gave them the money. I didn't have much of an idea what they are going to do. <laughs> but still, I, I gave them the money. They created this unbelievable a product, and uh, the rest is history, as, uh, as they say. 
absolutely uh, inspirational. Uh, Stefan, when, when, when you actually see that excellent video produced by uh, Gordon Robertson from uh, CBN and looking at the reasons behind uh, Israel's uh, incredible economic success story, and uh, you've echoed very much the same themes in this program mm. today as well, uh, and yet we have something known as the boycott, divestments and sanctions, doesn't make it absolutely stupid how any uh, Western nation could take on the BDS and start to boycott Israeli goods uh, in this modern world. It's almost impossible, isn't it? Uh, it is. There's actually a really interesting YouTube video that um, people, the viewers at home, can, can uh, Google, um, which uh, talks about if you want to boycott Israel, then, then do it properly. We've seen it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and so then, you know, get rid of your computer, get rid of your smartphone, don't drive your car anymore, uh, throw out half of the medications that you use, and, and basically go back and live inside a cave. Um, because everything almost that we have in our world today has some correlation or connection uh, to innovation that has come out of Israel. Uh, and unfortunately, people uh, don't uh, understand enough and, and look enough uh, into what is behind the BDS movement uh, and just kind of go along with the flow. And, uh, and the BDS, uh, basically their, their attempt obviously is to, is to destroy Israel financially from an economic perspective. Uh, and, and I'm sorry to say that they have actually done uh, quite a good job uh, up until now. And that's why, uh, again, I believe that as believers, we should be combating that and fighting against it, not only on a uh, you know, more of the political uh, level, but also in a practical way. Uh, and, and that can be done also by investing uh, in Israel in various ways. I mean, the classic example, isn't it, is the whole issue to do with SodaStream. I mean, here's a very successful uh, Israeli uh, product and uh, company. It's been certainly around since the 1980s. They had their main factory based beyond the Green Line. The majority of those they employed were Palestinians uh, and gave them um, salaries that were three <coughs> times higher than those of their counterparts in the same area do doing other jobs. Uh, and yet the BDS put pressure on SodaStream and also NGOs like Oxfam put pressure on SodaStream. Uh, and so they moved their factory from uh, you know, Judea and Samaria into uh, Israel with inside the green line and there's a huge loss of uh, work, Palestinian workforce who are not going to find the same sort of job with the same sort of money and the same sort of salary that SodaStream paid for and it just shows you how that um, BDS is actually damaging and hurting uh, cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians uh, as well as hurting the Palestinian economy rather than the Israeli economy. Yeah, I think it shows that the BDS movement isn't so much concerned about helping the Palestinians so much as it's concerned about just destroying Israel because they hate Israel. Uh, I think that there's a spiritual aspect behind that. It's a spiritual war going on, um, and, and those people uh, are simply being a, a vessel used by the devil uh, to try and come against um, God, uh, Israel as God's startup nation because of what is yet to come uh, in the future. And, and like I said at the beginning of the program, I believe that that's uh, uh, tied uh, directly to the second coming uh, of the Messiah. And uh, yeah, like you said, uh, you know, the, the BDS, they, they shot themselves in the foot and they shot uh, the Palestinians uh, in the knees uh, to an extent with that uh, uh, stint that they pulled with um, SodaStream. And just to see the hypocrisy uh, also of just what we've been hearing about recently here in the UK, uh, about uh, Oxfam and, and, and everything that's being discovered there now and, and them being main one of the main uh, advocates and, and uh, opposers to SodaStream that caused them to move their plant uh, back into Israel, causing heavy losses to, to, or heavy expenses, should I say, not losses, but, but just expenses to actually move. And then because of the limitations with uh, Palestinians coming into Israel for work and them needing uh, work visas, um, not, I don't believe that all of those workers were able to come uh, into Israel. I don't know the exact numbers. It, it may have been almost all of the workers. Uh, but still, it, it, was, it was something that was benefiting more the, the Palestinian population uh, probably than what it was uh, benefiting the, the Israelis. And, and even going beyond the, the finances and, and money involved, uh, when you actually go into the factory and you see the relationships, and there's lots of videos uh, that you can see, uh, I think, on YouTube as well, uh, and news reports that have been done, certainly in Israel, about the atmosphere and what actually goes on in that factory. And you see the relationships between people, between 
Palestinians and between Jews and you see how people can get on uh, and that these people, they don't care about the politics that are involved. They, they want to make a living for their family. They want their family to be able to have a, a, a hot meal at the end of the day, a roof to live under. And, and so do the, the Jews on the other side and basically just want to live together in, in, in harmony and seeing how that is possible through a company like SodaStream, yet the BDS doesn't look at that. They're just looking at uh, whatever's on their agenda and then uh, rushing ahead uh, like a bull into a red flag uh, to try and come against it. Yeah, let's have a look now at the second part of uh, Gordon Robinson's um, insight into uh, the success that it Israel's technological advancement. That unbelievable product was ICQ, the world's first instant messaging service. Less than a year later, America Online bought the company for $400 million. Very hard to extract the DNA of uh, success. You have to understand if you venture, you cannot do only successes because if you are trying to be involved in an area where there are only successes, you are not taking risks. So failure comes with the territory. Failure is not a four-letter word. The last time I looked, failure is part of the process. Not every team wins every game, but you got to try. And if you fail, you got to learn from your uh, mistakes and then pick yourself up and do it right again. Are the failure rates lower in Israel than they are in the rest of the world? And they're not. Israelis don't fail any less. The difference is they just keep trying. People don't understand, for example, if you're presented the choice of investing in two entrepreneurs, one who's actually never tried it before, one who's tried and failed, always take the guy who has tried and failed. Your statistical odds of getting a return on your investment are far better with that person. If you're looking for the next generation of high-tech success stories in Israel, you won't find them in business school. In most job interviews here, the big question isn't where you went to college, but where you served in the military. When I get a resume, the first thing I look at is what did this kid do in the Army? I don't look at the university, I look at the Army unit, because that's gonna tell me a lot about who that person is. In Israel, almost every single Israeli serves in the military. Almost every single Israeli is put through this training in how to lead, how to manage, how to make very difficult decisions with very little information under enormous pressure. And these skills hardwire young people for being entrepreneurs and launching and running or helping to run startups. We give the chance for every soldier to express himself and to say what he really believes without punishing him because his rank is a lower rank. So I have to tell you that sometimes listening to these officers, they raise a lot of stupid ideas in my point of view, 40, 50, 60 percent, but 20, 30, 40 percent are wonderful ideas. Once they're out of the army, soldiers take the same skills they've learned tracking terrorists and use them to make life safer for civilians. Israelis have developed everything from bomb-sniffing mice to software that prevents identity theft to a scanner that lets you keep your shoes on during security checks at the airport. Many Israeli IT companies are founded by alumni of an elite military intelligence unit known as 8200, a highly secretive group that specializes in cyber warfare. Unit 8200 is believed to be the brains behind the Stuxnet virus that targeted Iran's nuclear facilities. In my company, uh, in the R&D team, 80% of the uh, engineers are coming from Unit 8200. Major General Aharon Farkash was the commander of Unit 8200 for four years. And when he retired from the Army, he used that experience to help design a security system known as SafeRise, a virtual doorman that uses both voice and facial recognition to protect offices and apartment buildings. 
Israelis are proud to say that many of their high-tech ideas come from their experience in the Army, an idea some say could also benefit American companies. American businesses have a lot to learn with how Israel has integrated their military people when they're coming out of the military into the economy. It's really got to be part, I think, of everybody's culture. And certainly the heroes who are coming back in America from Iraq and from Afghanistan, they need to be the first guys to get the jobs because they have actually taken leadership and led, and they're the kind of people who you want to hire. And uh, Stefan, uh, the final report there by uh, Gordon uh, Robertson and, and looking at the military success uh, and how the uh, giving Israeli soldiers uh, such as yourself uh, that responsibility at such young age produces the, uh, the incredible entrepreneurial spirit that mm -hmm. is in Israel. Uh, we're down to the last five minutes of the programme. So for any of our viewers who would like to invest in Israel, um, how can they do that and what can they get in return? So that's really one of the areas that uh, we specialize in and focus uh, on at uh, Wise Money Israel, being a, a portfolio management uh, firm licensed with the ISA, the Israel Securities Authority, uh, and the only one in Israel that is uh, messianic-based or messianic-run. Um, and so there are probably only a, a very few limited ways to actually invest in Israel. Um, and, and let me detach uh, for a second, there's to invest in Israel on a philanthropic uh, level, which is more donation-based, giving to various causes, ministries, organizations, and that's good and that's needed. Uh, but then there's also the side of investments uh, that is uh, more business orientated, that goes directly into the economy and is not a gift that an investor gives away and does not receive back again, at least not in this life but something that they can place in Israel and then see it uh, uh, influence and impact the economy, help build the economy, and then also receive a return back uh, uh, as time goes on. And so what we do at Wise Money Israel is we work mainly with believers from around the world uh, to invest in Israel's capital market, which is the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, uh, investing them in companies and in technologies um, by investing in, in the stocks and the corporate bonds of these uh, companies, um, hereby uh, advancing them, growing them, and, uh, and then obviously the, the clients who, who are invested and put their funds actually in Israel uh, gain a number of uh, advantages uh, in their investment or savings portfolio. Uh, some of them would be geographical uh, diversification, uh, meaning their funds, they have some of their funds outside of their local country uh, in a different nation, in Israel in this case. They receive currency diversification. Uh, so um, all of the uh, accounts that we manage are all denominated in shekels, and uh, the shekel is a very strong currency. Uh, just uh, in December of 2017, I believe it was, uh, Deutsche Bank uh, released a report uh, claiming that uh, is, uh, the shekel uh, was, uh, I believe it was the second strongest or the, or the strongest economy, I think it was the second strongest, um, not economy, currency, uh, currency yeah. uh, in the world uh, after the, the, the Chinese RMB. And uh, it appreciated between six to seven percent against a basket of uh, currencies, and so it's a very strong currency to be in, uh, at least at the moment. But also the outlook is for the the Israeli shekel to continue to grow and strengthen. Um, besides that, there's obviously exposure to a number of different uh, very sought after sectors, the high tech sector, like we've been uh, hearing about and talking about throughout the program, uh, the defense industries, the biomed industries, the agricultural industries. Um, you know, there's, there's so many of them all on the Tel Aviv exchange that you just simply can't uh, have exposure to uh, uh, in other ways. Um, and so there's, there's all of that uh, diversification, uh, that uh, exposure as well. And then uh, as we've been seeing that, uh, you know, the, the returns that our clients have been making obviously very dependent upon what kind of a portfolio they actually have and, and um, how, how aggressive it is and how volatile it is. Uh, but we've seen our clients making uh, good returns on, on their, uh, on their uh, investments. And when you actually look at the Tel Aviv uh, stock exchange over time, uh, you see that it outperforms uh, Wall Street by far. If you'd have taken any investment amount and put it into uh, between 2001 and 2017, 
uh, into the FTSE 100, you would have made about 24% on your investment. That same investment in the US in the um, S&P 500 would have made 103% uh, um, uh, return on investment, which is good, doubling your funds. But if you had have taken that same amount and put it in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, you would have made 199% on your investments. So you would have tripled uh, your funds. So we see that it's good uh, in many ways. Uh, not only uh, is it a spiritually good thing to do, but also financially, it has a very strong financial uh, reasoning for investing in Israel and in Israel's capital market. Uh, Stefan, I just want to thank you so much uh, for being my guest on today's Middle East Report. And uh, it's like you're doing absolutely incredible work, not only a pastor, but also pioneering uh, in terms of uh, Israel's economy and uh, Israel's startup nation. And as you rightly call it to uh, God Startup Nation. So thank you for being my guest today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. We've learned about Israel's incredible success story as a startup nation, but we also have to remember that uh, Israel is God's startup nation, and this is his special nation with a special plan and a special purpose, and that Israel would be a light unto the Gentiles and a blessing unto the world, and we can see that in Israel today. So we're going to leave you with this uh, very, very powerful um, song that's dedicated to the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. to God, peace on earth, goodwill to all men, here with the angels we sing. And as He reigns from above, may He reign in our hearts, our sovereign Lord and King. Oh, Emmanuel, oh,
love.